Awesome. Uh, welcome to the 14th SunCup Global Summit, everyone. Thanks so much for joining this session today. Um, my name is Ariel. I'm with the SunCup team joining in from Nairobi, Kenya. The session that you have joined is sold on gender inclusion, but stuck on where to go from here, a grounded discussion on stumbling blocks and ways forward. Uh, this session is being hosted in collaboration with Value for Women. And I would like to hand it over to the session's moderator, who's Aprajita Agrawal, uh, the Director of Strategic strategy and development with value for women um, and Apu it's great to have you here I'll hand it over to you thank you Ariel and thank you uh, to the Sankal team for for getting us here today um, really excited to be here as Ariel said my name is Aprajita Agrawal I represent value for women we are a 10 year almost a 10 year old company now uh, a social enterprise and a specialized advisory services firm um, which is remotely located and with a fully virtually distributed team. Uh, we are a team of about 35 um, consultants and we work on helping businesses with becoming more gender inclusive. We work with a very wide variety of stakeholders um, across, across the globe, uh, and, uh, but all our work is very much focused on making, uh, making gender very much a part of the reality of how businesses, uh, businesses do uh, businesses build gender inclusion into their work um, for today's session? And I think I'm going to ask whoever is toggling the slide to go to uh, go to slide two. Uh, for today's session, this is we will aim to keep this very interactive, uh, and we are going to uh, today we are going to share you know our perspectives on what we hear from the partners that we work with and the enterprises and support organizations that we work with on. Um, on what are the stumbling blocks that they face when they're trying to become more gender inclusive, um, as well as what are the fixes that work for them? What are those solutions that they have found and um, that, or, or the formulas that, that they've tested that really work for them to ensure that they are able to integrate gender much better in, into, their, into their work. Uh, we are going to hear perspectives from um, two uh, colleagues from the industry, we have Delight and Will Grow. Delight is represented by Shalish Gupta today, who's the managing director at Delight India, and uh, Janan, who's the chief operating officer at Will Grow. They are both going to talk about um, their own experiences of integrating gender and, and the kind of stumbling blocks that they see in their um, in in their work. Uh, and then, of course, we will open it up for um, for a group activity and hope to hear from all of you in terms of, in terms of the solutions that work. Uh, for all of you to address these blocks. Um, to start with, um, I'm also going to introduce my colleagues quickly. I have two other colleagues on this call. We have uh, Trina, uh, Trina Roy, who's based in India, and she works with us as a gender and business uh, senior specialist, uh, focusing on assignments that uh, are around research as well as technical assistance to enterprises and investors. Uh, Luis Marcus, who is my colleague who's based in Maputo in Mozambique, is uh, the Director of Advisory Services at Value for Women and has uh, been a veteran at providing um, advisory services, technical assistance to financial institutions, enterprises, investors, and enterprise support organizations uh, in emerging markets uh, in Latin America as well as in Africa and Asia. Um, Luis is going to um, going to present the stumbling blocks uh, later today and talk about the solutions. Um, and uh, what I'd, I'd love to request all of you is to introduce yourself use the chat box to introduce for those of you who are joining through Vova. I am not sure if there's a direct integration with Zoom, but feel free to leave um, leave your details on Vova. I think you can start chat or uh, meet other attendees as well. Uh, so feel free to do that. Um, for people who are joining us through Zoom, uh, please use the chat box to leave your questions, comments, uh, introduce yourself and uh, what we'd love to hear from you is what you're expecting to hear from this session. If there are specific asks that you have, we will, we will try and cover those uh, or the questions that you have. We'll also try and see if we could cover those as well. Um, I've already talked a little bit about our work, uh, but just to highlight that we are a women-led organization, uh, a specialized advisory firm, and our mission is to promote women's participation in leadership uh, and leadership in business, finance, and investments. Um, we have worked with a very wide range of uh, clients and partners, including investors, fund managers, financial institutions, enterprises, and donors and foundations. Um, 
Our work really focuses on equipping businesses with hands-on knowledge and tools to implement gender in their day-to-day work and, and really be able to move the needle, not just have a strategy or an action plan, but, but really be able to move the needle on how they implement uh, inclusion at work. Um, with that, I am going to hand it over to Louise um, to take us through um, uh, the first few slides. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we wanted to take a step back and just, uh, we know a lot of you are what we call champions or, you know, you're bought in, but we like to set the stage. And one of, well, we're not exclusively talking about gender lens investing today. Uh, we are, that is a big piece, right? So those of you that are in the entrepreneurship and, eco and investment ecosystem, um, should think about what this is and might be promoting gender lens, whether you know it or not. So for us, gender lens investing is the deliberate incorporation of gender factors into investment analysis and decision in order to improve social, business, and, and investment outcomes. And we highlight deliberate or intentional there because um, the idea is not that you are investing, um, you know, investing uh, in a sector, for example, uh, like manufacturing that happens to have a lot of women in that sector and that's gender lens investing. Similarly, just because you happen to have a woman uh, led business in your portfolio, that, I mean, you, the idea is that we're, you, the idea is that you do it intentionally and deliberately and are thinking about how gender factors might impact the decisions that you make. And also that we do this to improve social and business outcomes. You know? I think I just, we just ask that you mute yourselves. I think somebody's off mute. Thank you so much. Um, and so today we will be um, we will be uh, presenting uh, or using as a framework a recent report that we uh, that we, that we about the journey, not a destination, um, where we set out. Uh, as part of a, a wider project and many projects that we have value for women where we've worked with uh, hundreds of entrepreneurship intermediaries, uh, SMEs, financial institutions, and investors um, just over the last two or three years. And one, one project that we worked on with Andy and the Walmart Foundation um, looked to work, work with both intermediaries, investors, and SMEs. And so... As part of that project, we we supported multiple multiple organizations, and and this this um, this report consolidates some of our learnings, and a new a new way of, for us to think about where organizations are on their journey uh, of of promoting gender inclusion. And so, before I get there, let me stop sharing for a second, and take a step back as to what. What is this all for? What are we trying to achieve? So when we talk about gender lens investing and gender inclusion in business and in finance, what is it that we want to achieve? Well, I'd like to use these gummy bears as an example. So if these gummy bears and this bowl represent the, you know, you know the 100% the of the capital being allocated to, to emerging market, small, medium, and growing businesses. Um, sorry, just throwing three green ones. And the red represent businesses that are led by men. Um, and then the green represent businesses that are led by women. Well, one key thing that we wanna do is that we want a lot more uh, women-led businesses that are part of this puzzle, right? That are receiving investment. But at the same time, we want 100% of these businesses, whether they're led by women, whether they're led by men, to think about, uh, to think about how gender equality might impact their uh, uh, their businesses, more gender diversity within those businesses, and also more more diversity in their value chain. So that's what we want. We want not only to invest in more women, but we want more businesses to be what we call gender forward. That are intentionally thinking about how to promote gender equality in their business operations. So that's the idea. So we want more of those businesses to grow and thrive, and that's what we want to uh, to achieve. Um, and so going back to the presentation, so we, uh, with Investing in Women, which is an initiative of the Australian government, a few years back, we created a, uh, a, a framework for thinking about this. And it's relatively simple, right? 
So in order to achieve these goals, we have three entry points. The first and, and entry point, sorry, I'll take these out so that you don't get confused, is, is, is very simple. It's literally one way to do generalized investing is to provide capital to businesses that are led by women or have this gender lens that we mentioned, right? Products and services that disproportionately support women, right? That could be from cook stoves to financial products that are tailored specifically for women to women in the value chain. Um, sorry, uh, on the mute thing again. So that's that's the first entry point. Another entry point is to mitigate gender biases and identify opportunities uh, for gender for gender equality throughout the investment process. This also applies. Uh, we sometimes just say the investment and, and business support process, right? So if you're an accelerator, an incubator, an organization that's supporting entrepreneurs, you could think of it the same. But the idea is all the way to from how businesses hear about you, how you identify businesses that you're going to work with or invest in, to how you select them, due diligence, how you support them, post investment support, to how you measure success that whole process is to think about how gender fits into all of those bubbles. And finally, it's walking the top, right? Looking within your own firm, within your organization, particularly in the investment space or in the finance space, looking at women's participation in uh, the financial positions, in investment committees, and, and basically the decision making. And so today we're not gonna go into the walk in depth because we don't have as much time. We You don't wanna hear uh, from me that long and we wanna to get to our speakers. But these are just your talking points, um, basically um, for framing the investment case and the impact case. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but basically we know women-led businesses present significant market opportunity, gender diversity in company leadership improves performance. There is ample evidence now from emerging markets on that from India, from Africa, from South Southeast Asia. Gender diversity at the investor level improves performance. We also have evidence on that from, um, again, from emerging markets, some recent data on, on there, um, from, again, Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa. So more and more over the last decade, we've had a lot of this evidence comes up. We still hear that this is needed, but we really do think that more and more this, this evidence over the last decade has been developed. And then the other talking point is, well, there's also this, there's an impact case, obviously, right? For And this is an impact summit. And beyond all the reasons that we know gender equality is good for uh, the economy, for social development, it's also the right thing to do. And then, so as part of this this, this project I mentioned before and other, other projects we have a value for women, um, we develop, we have a, something called the Gender Smart Nexus, which is a, a, a platform that you should all go on. We'll share the link in a bit. Uh, that allows you to take a self-assessment of how you're doing on gender, whether you're an investor, entrepreneurship support organization, a financial institution, or a business, an SME. And so well, when we looked at the data that we have thus far, we have, I think, about 400 to 500 users, but we have 104 entrepreneurship support organizations and investors, at least we did in June. And when we looked at the data, what we found was that there was a lot of commitment. And you can imagine that the organizations are filling out our survey, are you know are committed, are thinking about gender, they're engaged. However, few of them are cementing those commitments with strategies, targets, and budgets. So we found that you know, of the ones that fill out, you know, investors, entrepreneurship or, or organizations that are filling out our survey, right? So they're already engaged. 61% have a mission of, or objective focus on gender, only about half have an explicit strategy, and less than one in three have budgets or specific targets, right? Targets of all different sorts. And 10% are just taking no actions whatsoever. And again, that's from an engaged group. So why is that? So we'll go through a few stumbling blocks. These are really, they are gonna sound basic. So I have the question I have for you is, if these actions sound basic, why aren't you or your partners doing more of them? because it's, I, we think that gender is sometimes a little more nuanced and complex as an issue, right? We know that there's all the cultural contexts in, uh, in the countries that we work in and the sectors that we work in. So gender is not like building out a new technology necessarily. I think there's a lot of complexity to it. And that's why we think talking gender and acting, taking action on gender might be harder. So one thing we heard when we talked to a lot of, you know, we work with businesses, the entrepreneurship support organizations or investors is, 
less and less, but we still hear why gender, right? So everybody's saying we should do gender, but I don't really know why. And we also hear a lot about, we don't discriminate, we're gender blind. Uh, you know, why should we discriminate against, uh, discriminate against men? And we have a list of, of myths that we're not gonna go into right now that we hear. And so I think the message here is, um, there's a lot of evidence. I just pointed to some of it, right? There's a lot of evidence that's come up, particularly recently, right? And so there's a business case and it's good to create spaces to present that business case to, to uh, people in the organization, to find out what people are skeptical about and also to reassure. And I think that the reassuring is something that's important. We want to reassure that this is not about, this is about leveling the playing field. Right, we're talking about leveling the playing field, not discriminating against men, but rather creating opportunity, equal opportunities. Um, anyway, but we'll we'll talk about this. Uh, our speakers will talk to this, and I think we'll talk about it during the discussion. So that's the first stumbling block. Then the next one is okay. We're sold on gender. We know we should do more, but we don't know how to start the conversation. We're uncomfortable. I'm a you know I'm a junior person, junior woman in an organization, and I just don't feel like I have the power to do it. And so what can I do, right? Or uh, I'm a, you know, we're, a, we're a, a group of three white male investor partners working in Africa, we feel uncomfortable, right? So I think, uh, so a few things, and you can look at more detail in our report that we find are, are good is to make it somebody's job to have this conversation, right? So whomever it is, there should be a gender champion whose job it is to formally have the conversation. You could start with informal conversations and then move on to formal conversations, create a gender diversity committee um, and, and, and get started on, on, on those conversations and, uh, and, and create some accountability around them, right? Uh, so, so that's why gender and diversity committees might sound like a simple step, but that those, those are really powerful and we see them work quite a bit. The third piece is, okay, you've moved on, you've had the conversations, but now what do we do, right? We know we want more women. We've decided we want more women in our portfolio, but where do we start? What do we do? Um, and how do we prioritize? And so uh, we'll point you here to start with a gender assessment. I'd love to say that you should all hire value for women, but I don't think you all need to. There's a lot of free tools out there for you. So there's a, like the Gender Smart Nexus tool, which allows you to take a self-assessment of how you're doing and identifies what actions you're taking, what actions you could take, but particularly looking at, are you hearing from women? Are, do you have feedback loops from, from, from women in particular? And second, are you collecting, analyzing, and using sex segregated data for decision-making? Uh, we found like a lot of our partners had the data, they just weren't using it, right? They weren't analyzing it. And for example, AMI, the African Management Institute, uh, had all this data on their business, online business development support services, they just haven't analyzed it. And when they analyzed it, they found that men and women uh, were using their platforms different, had different uh, success engagement, and that women particularly had more issues with connectivity and with time. Um, and so then they're thinking about how to redress those issues, right? Um, then, then finally, okay, We've been working in you know microfinance space for 40 years. We've been working with women for a long time. We have specific projects focused on women, but we don't know how to embed it into our organizational DNA. We find a lot of organizations are here, particularly those that started out in the NGO space or in development space. So they've been working on it one off as part of a project. They got a women's project here or there, but they don't have a gender strategy, right? So. That's the place to start, develop a gender strategy. Again, use the tools mentioned before, do a self-assessment. You can use the Gender Smart Nexus, the Women's Empowerment Principles tool from you and women. Again, we'll share some of them in the, in the chat. Um, but that's the idea is this, this create a strategy and with specific goals and a budget. Again, that sounds simple, but very few organizations, like I said, half the organizations that we interviewed have that and even less have a budget or somebody that's made responsible. And finally, I think the key part here is have KPIs for gender linked to your business plan, your organizational plan, not just like a separate gender strategy, but make sure you have some KPIs on, on your, um, that the management is responsible for, both internally, right, with gender diversity within the organization and externally. 
And finally, something we found because this the last uh, last two years have had to do with COVID, particularly with when this in this case with entrepreneurship support organizations, and also um, businesses that are uh, you know trying to pivot to digital, was that they th a lot of organizations, some of them that we work with, thought that moving to a digital program to support entrepreneurs, for example, was going to become a silver bullet because accessibility would be easier and they could overcome some of these gender challenges. But when we move on to digital, there's different challenges we found. In some cases, uh, organizations were very surprised by women's access uh, to digital capabilities, but the way they interact is different than how men interact, right? So women might, uh, since they tend to want to know more about what they're using and how it works, um, they they might uh, they might not use it unless they have all the details of how something's going to work. And generally speaking, uh, they still want some sort of in-person um, program, right? So where it was possible, some of the organizations were figuring out how to do hybrid programming. Um, and then with digital, the other piece is you have a lot of data, right? A lot of times you're collecting a lot of data. So some organizations that hadn't been looking at sex segregated data and started using usage of how their platforms are being used by men and women started to see some patterns that they could redress. Um, again, just for the use for, for uh, time expediency, I'm not gonna go into more depth. I know that's a little general, but the idea today is to think about where are you as an organization and we'll have some conversations about where you could go. Um, and now let's take a poll. And uh, so let's, let's make sure that comes up on the screen. Thank you. And so the question is, which of these five is the biggest, oh, sorry. Which of these five is the biggest stumbling block for your organization current is, is that your organization is currently facing, right? So where do you think you sit on this, right? Um, where are you on this? And, and maybe you're a little off it, right? Which, which, which could happen. But, uh, but try and do the exercise of where you think you're sitting. And then the idea for the, the breakouts that we'll have today is, okay, you're sitting there. What do you need to go to the next? Um, and so we'll just give you a few to fill this up. By the way, I have not been able to see the chat at all. So if there's questions in there. I rely on Aprajita and Trina to let me know if there's anything we need to be addressing. But we are also trying to get to the speakers. So I want to make sure we have time for that. Still need a few more of you to fill out the poll. Slowly getting some answers there. We'll just give it a few more seconds. Sorry. Okay. Um, let's just close that in. Can we end the poll and show it? Thank you. Is it, is it being shown? Okay, perfect. So most, so I think, you know, between those three, three top ones, right? So it seems like, which makes sense. You're here in this room. You don't need to be convinced, convinced on the why. Maybe you don't feel it. You don't feel the like conversation is uncomfortable, but you are figuring out the how. Where do you start? Or how you embed it into the DNA, or the digital piece came out. So that's that's great. That's that's good to know. So we'll, well, I think uh, later we'll break out and try and uh, pick those top three and, and to to have a deeper conversation on. Now I'm going to hand back over to uh, Prajita. Thanks, Luis. Sorry, toggling with my mute button here. Um, thanks, and with that, we'll come. We've come to the panel panel discussion part of our uh, of of this session. I'm delighted to have Junan and Felish on um, to to share their perspectives today. Um, Junan is uh, with Belgro, and she um, is the chief operating officer at Belgro. Felish is the managing director of the Light India, and with both of them, um, what I'd love to um, sort of start a conversation about is to understand their own perspectives in um, as, as far as the stumbling blocks go and how, how does this resonate with them. So maybe I'm going to start with uh, Janan with, with, with you first. Uh, 
And I guess my question to you, Janan, is is really understanding what motivated Bill Grow um, to prioritize gender inclusion, and how do you operationalize it in in your day to day sort of work at at Bill Grow? Um, and and maybe for some of the people who who may not know Bill Grow, a quick introduction might be useful. Although I I, I think you guys are pretty well known. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Aprajita, and thanks, Luis. I think that was a really wonderful introduction to. Um, how people are thinking about gender inclusion and the stumbling blocks. I could very well see our journey resonate with what you were speaking about. Um, so hi, I'm Janan. I work with Bill Grow. Bill Grow is one of India's first uh, incubators that was set up purely to focus on social enterprises. Um, and over the last 20 years, you know, we've worked with companies that are in healthcare, in climate action, and in agriculture. And we're currently undergoing a strategy refresh, which is a very exciting time. Uh, but more of that perhaps later. Um, I'm happy to share with you all uh, about our journey and you know the inspiration behind it. So I think quite a few years ago, maybe um, five years ago or so, um, our founder Paul Basil, um, I think it was him who sort of you know put words to the fact that uh, gender inclusion is something that is important and something that Bill Road too needs to articulate uh, in terms of why is it important to us and what we want. Sorry, got muted by accident. I think again. There we go. Is that better? Hopefully, no yes. more mutes. Yeah. Um, so when you know when he um, took that first step, um, he really sort of highlighted and spotlighted gender inclusion as something that's important to the organization. And when a leader of the organization does that, I think it gives a lot of other folks in the organization the ability to say, hey, I find that interesting too. I think this is important too. I think there were many people in the organization, including myself, that thought it was something that Wilgro, as a pioneer in the space, should be talking about and should be talking about very actively and very publicly. So once there was leadership um, you know, that, that vocalized this, I think another thing that he also did was he shared that mandate, right? So he shared it with others in the leadership team. He shared the mandate with others in the organization and sort of put together, as you were talking about, a sort of informal committee to understand what is the space like, right? What are other incubators doing? And to find out what is it that Bilbo should be doing? You know, we, we had heard of multiple activities, multiple tasks, multiple ways of, um, you know, embedding a gender lens. But when it comes to Wilgro's uniqueness, our strengths, how can we be leveraging that, you know, for gender inclusion? And that's something that we did over a period of time. You know, we really studied the space, we studied the gaps, we studied as an organization, where should we be playing a role? And I think um, that has really led to inspiration in a lot of people because then it stopped being about gender is important and we should be doing it. It became more about Bilgro as an organization has a role to play in this. Bilgro as an organization in the past has addressed ecosystem gaps in pipeline building, has addressed ecosystem gaps when it comes to networking, knowledge generation. Um, Bilgro should also be playing a role in, in, in bridging this gap of gender smart incubation and having gender smart businesses. So because that then became something that the organization resonated with and something that we could very personally relate to um, as folks who had been in Wilbro, that became a, a sort of inspiration that was spread across. Um, so that was one. The second was, you know, what I talked about in terms of sharing that mandate. And again, what Luis was referring to, which is building that accountability. Somebody in the organization needs to be accountable for certain steps to be taken forward. That was also something that was put in. Um, in terms of oper operationalizing, and I think what really kicked us off well um, was a couple of years ago when we started working with Shell Foundation and Value for Women uh, on a project which helped us look at how can we include more women into the workforce of the value chains of the enterprises that we work with. And I think what that did was it gave us a sort of assurance that the way we were thinking about embedding gender into incubation the way we were thinking about it was we were on the right track. You know, I think many of us, we had a lot of confidence in our incubation methodology. You know, it's something we had fine-tuned over many years. We also had confidence that the way it's designed lends itself quite well to an equitable way of doing work. But to have an expert come in 
have a look at it. Share with us certain ideas, certain points here and there where we may have missed it. I think that our confidence levels were tremendously boosted to know that, hey, we do know what we're doing. We can do this uh, and it's possible. So I think operationalizing really helped when we had other supporters, um, both from a financial standpoint, but also from an expertise standpoint um, to validate our thinking on what we wanted to do ahead. And I think that really, really kicked us off and that really set us off on a very, very strong path moving forward. I'll pause there, Apraj. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Janan. I think the last point that you said especially resonated with me uh, and having worked uh, on incubation programs before, I think that's always a challenge. We think we are inclusive enough and that we have designed a program for everyone. And I think to be able to bring in the nuance that gender inclusion, that a complex topic like gender inclusion needs uh, is, I, I, I think is something that we would encourage uh, other enterprise support organizations that might be in the session to, to do as well. Bring, uh, bring an external voice, have question what you're doing, ask your entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs or women business owners, uh, whether the program that you've designed works for you or not. So I think, uh, great, Janan, I'm going to move, to move to Shailesh for my next question and then come back to you. Uh, Shalish, um, uh, Delight again needs no introduction. Uh, you're in India or in the in the clean energy space, uh, but I'm keen to hear from you um, on which of these stumbling blocks resonate with you most at Delight. And uh, you also have, as we are we are aware that you're working through some of the gender related uh, aspects at at Delight here as well as globally. Uh, talk to us about which of these which of these stumbling blocks specifically resonate with you? Thank you. Thank you, Prajita. Thank you, Sankalp team, and uh, for providing this opportunity to Delight team here in India to share our experiences and also to learn from our other fellow panelists here. So um, I I'll probably take a minute just to, uh, before I arrive at the stumbling blocks and uh, the realization there, I would first talk about that Delight achieved a unique uh, landmark of transforming 100 million lives through its uh, erstwhile portfolio of uh, solar portable lanterns, solar home systems. And they were sold in the deepest rural corners of the world. And uh, in India, if I look at it, out of these 100 million lives transformed, India contributed almost like 43, 44 million lives all put together. 70% of those products were sold uh, through microfinance institutions, uh, which where the traditionally the customers are self-help group uh, members and they are women. Okay. So uh, from the user application perspective and from the transformation perspective, if I talk about uh, supporting uh, and probably making this world a better place for uh, uh, females, women, folk, I think that has been inherent as part of our product application. and. Uh, in fact, the foundation of Delight uh, is through an experience by our founders in Myanmar where the first sample was given to a brick maker. She was a female. And when she was asked to return the product, she started crying because the kind of transformation it brought into her life, uh, the children of her children, it was amazing. So uh, I think uh, from the application point of view, yes, we have been focused on bringing in this kind of a transformation. However, this realization had been missing in our lives till 2019 December when we achieved this 100 million lives and we set our ambition to achieve uh, the next milestone, which is a 1 billion lives to be transformed by 2030. And then that's when we realized that, yeah, we need to go a little deeper than what we have been doing because transforming 1 million lives is going to require significant amount of investments. It would require significant amount of balancing of skills. Uh, a lot more gender inclusiveness in the way we are approaching things. So I, I believe that uh, across the organization, the first stumbling block, which I could really see is that why gender? And when it came to us like six months back, because we have been on a serious, serious mission here to improve this uh, gender inclusiveness, not just in terms of numbers, also to bring in a DNA change. The first challenge is why gender? Um, we, we are all working in India and as we know that we, we always categorize certain jobs. So there is that insecurity amongst us that why should I hire a female for this position? Can she do that job? 
and when we try and hire uh, uh, females for certain positions which are in let's say certain functions like servicing or sales the next challenge comes in not from within the organization the next challenge comes in from the families of those employees who would be very very apprehensive about uh, letting the female of the house travel alone in the rural areas and there is safety there is security and these are the challenges which we are facing so that's the next stumbling block if i if i have to talk about which is inherent culture in which we are all we have all grown up our families um i think the third big big thing is of course which is more a legacy issue that there are no female leaders within the organization our top leadership was always comprising of male leaders in india or even outside also so i think that's another another point uh, which i think it it will get over, crossed over a period of time i think doing conversations is not difficult i would say inside the organization however how do i make gender inclusion as part of my dna that is the biggest stumbling block which i see because uh, not many of us feel that it is important and accordingly policies have not been drafted uh, so there is the missing policy framework uh, while we were allowed to work from home during covid period uh, i myself have uh, might have let a lot of our female employees to work from a distance um, probably uh, i think there was no firm policy framework which where which could have lent support to those females to feel a little more assured about how their careers are going to get advanced inside the organization so uh, as uh, janan mentioned about uh, uh, i think all the big big things happen in an organization once the senior leadership gets aligned and they are they realize about certain things and then that's how it is cascaded i think for delight also that has been a stumbling block there was uh, probably we were gender blind <laughs> if i if i put it very very bluntly and uh, yeah so for for us the stumbling block has been that how do we really bring it as part of my dna make it a part of my dna and uh, yeah so that's that's how the, it has been a journey for us yeah uh, we are very very happy on this journey we have we have developed products which are more gender sensitive which are more gender inclusive however within the organization how do i really make the other gender also part of this journey they are there there is a gender equality So, thanks thanks shalish yeah that was very candid and uh, very honest so really appreciate that i um yeah i'm curious to curious to hear if you hear uh, some of the resistance when when you're talking about you know imbibing gender inclusion into the organizational dna is that a question of what you can do with your workforce or is there also a challenge with the buy in that that you need at like the you know probably the senior most leadership levels or you know how the organi- organization may operate globally so uh, both the things uh, i'll i'll first talk about uh, a very again very candidly i will share so we were looking to hire a, a hr admin manager here and which is a highly i would say engaging job it requires a person to travel around to talk to lot of these contractors vendors it requires a lot of tough talk, talking even with the team members also ensuring the norms are being followed so the recommendation which i got from some of the senior leaders i'm talking of in the india team is uh, let's get some let's get a male for this position don't bring in a female it will make things difficult and uh, and i i realized where they were coming from so uh, so that, that's the kind of mindset is which is there and we got a female for that position and she is doing a brilliant job okay and uh, in fact lot of the issues which we were facing while having a earlier a male person a male who was managing it i think it brought a lot of balance into the way things were being approached from the admin perspective so mm. that's that's where the mindset is and the second part is the conversation part uh i think conversations uh, uh, that way it's a small organization we are a team of 100 let's say with some 45 odd people coming to office every day so we know each other we are we are very friendly i think the, the biggest part the challenge is that uh, there is no policy framework to 
support uh, gender inclusiveness and uh, so it depends on the line manager that what does he or she think about bringing in uh, that kind of mindset in the team and it, it has to be again driven from the top that say if delight is working towards um, let's say achieving 30 percent gender ratio by march 23 which we are targeting to how is the rest of the team going to support it and are they ready to of course accept a female coming into a particular position uh, for a job for a role which they perceive must be done by, uh, by 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 a male here so i think so bringing that logic and uh, i'm i'm very very happy to have partnered with the valley for women here in india that uh, we have brought in a very very organized and structured approach to it where the champions for that initiative have been drawn from from the leadership all the head of departments are part of it uh, then there is an accountability also built in uh, amongst all those champions and uh, there is a discipline around passing on the message to the rest of the team so we are restructuring those uh, these hiring processes the job descriptions are being redefined the questions in an interview which we may ask to a female employee which may be very very sensitive like when do you expect to get married do you have any apprehensions about women about uh, what are your family plans would your family stop you from traveling i think those are the things which we have been insensitive about uh, i'm not talking about delight here also i'm talking about even well grown organizations big sized organizations also where we face these challenges so it is it is altogether a cultural change fostering that culture of inclusiveness that's where we have to work upon and uh, yeah. yeah i'm really thanks. glad that yeah, we are we are on this journey yeah thanks thanks shalish i think yeah i think it's a it's a learning journey for for all of us and i think constantly we as as people who work in the gender inclusion space i think are also learning every day about the 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 complex nuances and how it plays out in different societies and culture and countries um but with that i think i'll come back to janan i know janan you're only here for another 15 minutes or so so uh, we do want to maximize that uh, janan i'm curious to hear from you about you know apart from these five stumbling blocks what are there other stumbling blocks are there other challenges that you've uh, seen especially when it comes to inclu- uh, becoming more gender inclusive and for your portfolio companies i mean let's for will grow uh, but more for the portfolio companies that work um, a lot of them are working on the grassroots as well or or in rural areas here in india yeah um, so yeah. yeah absolutely thank you and i think sherish you've really set a very strong realistic on ground backdrop to this right so there are three main um, stumbling blocks that we've experienced uh, with our enterprises and of course this also must be considered um, you know in the whole pandemic lens so um, one is that when there's a change in personnel so sometimes the people who you know have that mandate or have that passion to be able to include the gender lens um if for any reason they move on from the organization or even go on a long break uh, in the case of the pandemic you know had to take about a month off um what happens then right so one of the things we learned was you know when it comes to building accountability uh, when it comes to championing within the organization um it needs to be more than one person uh and it also needs to be something that is not uh, the committee the mandate of the committee or the mandate of the group you know the question needs to be turned around a little bit to say how can we make gender inclusion work for our business goals how can we make it work for us rather than gender inclusion is good to do and so now what are the ways in which we can check the boxes when you turn that question around to how can we make it work for us people start to see a very direct uh, and sometimes even quite a um, a short term medium term and long term uh, you know business plan growth plan right for your organization so um, the change in personnel does definitely affect things and so we realize that we need to have multiple people and those multiple people need to be bought into the business case of why it makes sense for their organizations um the second is you know quite plainly in terms of crisis right so when uh, when you go through a pandemic um, all of our companies you know what happened then was businesses came to a standstill right so when businesses come to a standstill and um, you're talking about okay how many let's get gender disaggregated data uh, let's talk about marketing materials which you know are more inclusive those things just 
you know, the entrepreneur will look back at you and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> to look around you, my priority is to stay afloat, right? But um, I think once the once somebody has experienced how, hey, my, women are 50%, potentially 50% of my customer base. So for me to stay afloat, perhaps there's something I can do uniquely. Perhaps here's a chance for me to innovate. And that's how I can stay afloat. But crisis uh, tends to deprioritize things which were anyway looked at as an add-on, a bolt-on, good to do, but not pressing concern right in front of me, fire burning. So that was the second um, stumbling block. So how do you safeguard for times of crisis in a way where you're embedding gender inclusion as one of your strategies, which keep your business strong and resilient, right? Um, and the third stumbling block, was, which is a little more detailed, but I think um, it became something that's very exciting for our enterprises. So, you know, um, we started to, so once we had built the case of, okay, you have 40% of your customers and end users are women, right? But your marketing team, your sales team, your marketing collaterals, where you are selling those locations, all of that is so male dominated. Let's now start employing strategies where you have women doing the demos of the products uh, and they are doing the demo to other women, you know, to groups of to self-help groups. So 150 women in the room and there are four or five of you who are actually doing demos, speaking to other women. And, um, you know, that was great. And we said, okay, but then what we saw was sales didn't convert, right? So then, then what do you do? What's the next step that you take when you've been able to work with someone, done, piloted this, you know, program where you're having women uh, representing that particular product, doing the sales, but then sales don't convert. There, what you need is a bit of curiosity uh, and a bit of problem solving, right? And luckily, the experience we had with those entrepreneurs was that that curiosity and the problem solving mindset existed because we realized, we dug in and we understood that, okay, the reason why the sales are not happening is not because there's no appetite. It's not because the women didn't want to purchase those products. It's because they didn't have the financing to. Once we were able to bring in an end user financing partner and we were able to demonstrate that entire loop, sales started to increase. So there will be real challenges where somebody comes back to you and says, hey, listen, we thought this was going to work, but it hasn't. You know, it's been such a waste of time. We put in all this effort. Um, so you really need people who are along with you who have, um, who have a problem solving capability um, you know, to really dig a little deeper and keep pushing uh, till the end. But these are real challenges that happen when you are executing on ground. Fantastic, Janan. I think very, very insightful and uh, some some great sort of insights coming from the work that you've, you, you all have been doing with your portfolio companies. Um, I know we have about 12, I guess, 11 to 12 minutes before we close the panel discussion. So one question for both of you, and maybe Janan, you can go first. Um, which, um, you know, if you had to look at the stumbling blocks, whether the ones that we talked about or the ones that you, you've seen in your own work, um, are there results or solutions on how you overcame it or overcame one of them and results that you're very proud of? Uh, and, you know, I really want our audience to hear about how do organizations practically deal with some of these challenges? And maybe there's an example or two that they can take away from, from this discussion and say, well, we heard Will Grow talk about this and we heard Eli talk about this and this is exactly what they did and they're so proud of it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I'll give one example for within Will Grow and one with our portfolio companies. Um, within Will Grow, you know, today as it stands, we have 50% uh, women in our middle management, in our senior management and our board. And that's something I am ridiculously proud of. Um, and I can see on a day-to-day -day basis how that influences the work that we do, how that influences the way we are looking at not just gender inclusion, but inclusion as a whole. I, you know, we now, be, and because it's sort of been articulated, you know, we took those steps one by one of having the leadership articulate, having the leadership put together a committee saying, this is your mandate. Your mandate is to be able to understand where should Vilgro be playing a role? Uh, where does it make sense for Vilgro to be playing a role? Over a period of time, 
the number of people within the organization who don't wear the hat formally, uh, but informally are now speaking up and saying, I'm very interested in this. How can I do it? My portfolio managers in the agri sector, or health sector come and say, I know we don't have funding for this, you know, in my sector, but how can we do it? So we have team members working to the constantly, regardless of whether there's a specific program for it, that are doing it as part of, you know, this is how it's done. So, and I love how the fact that uh, gender smart incubation has become how we do incubation. Um, to me, that is a fantastic uh, success indicator. So that is um, one piece. The second piece I think about um, our portfolio companies. So I think um, what has happened and the ripple effect of, you know, starting with say things like having um, uh, commission-based sales agents who are women going in in pairs, right? So the aspect of security, Shailesh, that you brought out, um, you know, we were able to address that by having women in pairs as commercial uh, commission-based sales agents. So they weren't uh, expected to go, uh, you know, for eight hours a day, but they went in twos for a few hours at a time. And that took care of the aspect of security. It also enabled a sense of camaraderie because then often the women were bringing their friends along. Right? And the fact that they were able to make a little extra money also worked well. Um, so things like that, things like, um, having um, women demo champions, right? So if we have, if we were able to track one sale uh, where a woman has purchased a solar dryer, for example, she's the one who's standing there and saying, this is the solar dryer I, I purchased. Here is Samunati, the partner who was able to actually give me the loan. This is the entrepreneur who will actually buy back my produce. So I am, I've not only been able to receive a loan and buy the, the device and, you know, I'm doing the drying of all of my different fruits and vegetables and herbs, but here's also the person who's buying it from me. So my, my revenue is a constant source of revenue. And that loop, closing that loop and having people speak for that loop themselves in the remotest parts of the country and having audiences of 100, 150 people, um, women, all women listening to this and then having government entities being motivated by this and saying, hey, you know what, actually these solar powered refrigerators will also work very well in my other initiative where I'm trying to promote uh, dairy. So then government entities are becoming motivated to actually start looking at how can innovations be embedded in meeting our own goals. I feel like that is something that um, is something we're extremely proud of. It took a long time. It took a lot of persistence. Um, but to see it happening on ground has just given us an immense amount of confidence. Thanks, thanks, Janan. Really, really powerful examples there. Uh, and and in case we don't get to uh, speak before you jump off, Janan, thank you so much for your time today thank on the you. channel. Thank you for uh, allowing me the time before Shailesh. Sorry about that, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. Time, yeah. So Shailesh, we'll we'll flip over to you uh, again. Anything work in progress? initiatives, results that you're really proud of? So, um, yeah, I think uh, it, it's it's a very, very different journey. And um, I will admit that Delight India, probably we are lowest in the rankings across Delight Global when it comes to gender parity. And uh, so as, as a leader, it, it really hurts me a lot when I see that kind of ranking coming in and uh, yeah, but uh, the good part here is that yeah, we we have accepted this as the new culture we would want to bring into the organization. So there are uh, two three things which we have done, and I would want to talk about that. So one part is that we have created this space, uh, the change uh, change management uh, coaching group which we have created. Uh, we have gone very very strong on it's partnering with Value for Women in driving this kind of change into the organization. And we have been able to get the buy-in of entire senior leadership in India team, where everybody has committed on certain objectives. Um, as part of uh, this rigorous drive and the learning curve where we have been, uh, we were somewhere like 4% uh, on our gender ratio uh, like six months back. I'm so happy that we have moved significantly. We are now at 11% on that. Um, there are still open positions and uh, we are hoping that to begin with first with the recruitment and then of course a parallel structural policy change 
support, we would be able to uh, improve our gender ratios and also make uh, our workplaces far, far more encouraging for uh, female to uh, feel assured about working in the organization, growing inside the organization, and bring in certain leaders at the top uh, overall for India business here. So uh, I think it's a journey for us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we work a lot with uh, with women as part of our customer groups. And uh, it will be very, very interesting to and uh, challenging for us. The, the challenging part here is that, let's say, hiring and recruiting, recruitment is also very, very challenging. So for example, if I'm looking for a person to work around with those partners, uh, getting the right scale has been a challenge, and, but, and it might be time consuming. But yeah, as uh, Janan mentioned that, what additional or what more can, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a different gender can bring and what, let's say, existing gender can't do. So that, that question still remains in the minds of certain leaders. And it is, it is a long-term change. I think maybe over a period of one year, one and a half year, when we are far, far more stronger in terms of our ratio, we would have the policies to support us and uh, maybe a set of leaders who are fully, fully bought into this and I think we would really reap those rewards. And there are there, there are uh, results from various other organizations which are which are able to perform far, far more productively. And uh, that's that's where Delight really want to be in. As far as uh, things about I'm really, really proud about, I'm very, very proud about the fact that in a, such a short period of time, uh, our team has really shown a great, great change in their mindset. And this is becoming part of our culture here. And this is going to improve further. There is only way upwards here. Um, yeah, the needle is going to tick up and uh, we will see the organizational leadership also changing the very, very short term period of time. Yeah. Great to hear. Thanks, Thanks Shalesh, again for, for that uh, honest share. And I think it's, it, it's a challenge that not, uh, that's not new to probably a lot of the attendees here and, and, and to all of us who are constantly trying to build uh, organizations that are more inclusive and, and equitable. Uh, so again, thank you um, for, for that share and thank you both uh, Janan and Shalesh for, uh, for being part of this session.